The views and opinions expressed on my story, Living with Lupus Podcast, represents each person's individual experience. By listening to this podcast or reading our blog, you agree not to use this podcast or blog as medical advice to treat any medical condition in either yourself or others. As always, consult your own physician for any medical issues that you may be having. My Story Living with Lupus podcast is officially trademarked, all rights reserved. Thank you for joining me for another episode of My Story Living with Lupus Podcast. I'm your host, Susan Hendricks, and I'm so glad that you could join me on this Friday, January 15th, 2021. This episode is all about for lupus, mental health, physical activity matters, and trends in long-term lupus outcomes. So, you know what I want you to do all the way from the United States to San Juan, Puerto Rico. That's right, get ready to grab your cup of coffee, your cup of tea, and to my listeners late at night. Now, you know I appreciate you, so go ahead, get ready to grab your favorite glass of wine, and come on and join the conversation right here on My Story Living with Lupus Podcast. How is everyone doing on this Friday? Are you glad that um, Friday is here? Well, let me tell you. I know that I am also glad about um, Friday being here. And I'll tell you why. You know, last week, um, I was at the hospital for a test to see what is going on with my gastrointestinal system. They think that the last flare I had, which was in November, that lupus attacked the gastrointestinal system. And um, I have been in pain. There is... They, um, I had a CAT scan done and they seen a blockage. Okay, I went to the hospital to have the procedure done. Um, they couldn't tell what blockage, what type of blockage it is. So, um, you're listening to this on Friday, so Thursday. I'm back at the hospital for another procedure to find out what type of blockage it is. Now, I've mentioned this before in a previous podcast. I have been able to consume solid foods. If I eat anything that is solid, I get nauseated. The pain in the my upper right quadrant, um, which is right up under the rib, is where I'm having this pain. It intensifies. So when that happens, I have to lay down. Now, it's one thing I did notice. Um, I was getting dressed the other morning, and um, I was putting on some lotion. I was lotioning my body and I felt what I take is the blockage. I 
felt the right side and I felt the left side. And I said, it's not on the left side what I'm feeling. It's on the right side. I say from what I felt, it's the size of a large lemon. It's hard and it hurts um, when I touch it. Now, whatever it is, um, I don't know if this will result in a hospital stay. And don't forget, you're listening to this on Friday, and I had the procedure on Thursday. And um, if it's not a inpatient kind of thing, I will see you guys next week. But if it is, I'll still record from my phone exactly what is going on in the hospital. I just pray that they get whatever it is that's blocking um, my intestines. I pray that they could get a biopsy of it to see if it's benign or or what it is, but today we're talking about, in this segment, first part of the segment, I should say, we're talking about exercise and lupus. Do you think it's beneficial? I do. Now, I haven't been able to exercise since November, just like I haven't been able to consume anything solid. I have not been able to exercise since November, but with regular low impact activities can be especially beneficial for those of us who suffer from this chronic illness called lupus. Walking, swimming, and yes, cycling, for example, can reduce muscle stiffness, boost muscular strength, prevent osteoporosis, relieve stress, and assist in better sleep. Now, if you're wondering what type of exercises I do, I have a total fitness um, machine in the basement along with an exercise bike. I have um, weights. um, And I also have a interactive, um, I call it a pad that you can hook up to the TV and you can do yoga. So I have that. And before um, I became ill um, with lupus, I would work out Every day I would get up at four o'clock from four to five. I would be on the treadmill, um, then shower and then get ready for work. And I did that twice a day. Now, after being diagnosed with lupus, I was no longer able to exercise like I used to. Um... From every day, twice a day, it boiled down to maybe once a week, and then maybe not at all, and then eventually when I started feeling better, um, I moved it up to three times a week, four times a week, and especially in the summer, I like to go to the park and walk around the nature trail. Let me tell you, that relaxes me so much. And I like being by the water. So 
If I can find a park with a nature trail by the water, I'm just in heaven because I listen to the sound of the water and it relaxes me. Or I'll sit by the water and just close my eyes and meditate. And that relaxes me. But it has been some research performed on being inactive versus being active when you have this illness. Now, inactivity among patients with systemic lupus erythematosus was associated with a more than threefold increased risk for development of depression, researchers reported among patients who describe themselves as inactive at baseline. Incident depression was diagnosed during the subsequent two years in 38% of SLE patients compared with 14% of those who were active, according to Sarah Patterson, MD, and colleagues from the University of California, San Francisco. In a multivariant analysis that adjusted for sex, race, comorbidities, and disease activity and damage, the hazard ratio for incident depression among inactive SLE patients was 3.88 or 95%. The researchers reported online in Arthritis Care and Research. Depression is very common among SLE patients being diagnosed in 40 to 50% at some point during their lifetimes compared with 17% of the general population and can have serious impact on numerous disease-related outcomes, including quality of life and disability. Though the higher prevalence of depression in lupus relative to the general population is well demonstrated. The psychological, biological, and lifestyle factors responsible and measures that can be taken to mitigate them are not yet well defined. Among the factors contributing to depression in the general public is physical inactivity. To examine the possible role of this factor in patients with SLE who often face barriers to exercise, including pain, fatigue, and medication adverse effects, the researchers conducted annual interviews of individuals enrolled in the California Lupus Epidemiology Study during the years 2007 to 2009. Now, depression was evaluated on the eight-item patient health questionnaire depression scale with scores of 10 or higher representing clinical depression, inactivity was determined by the rapid assessment of physical activity instrument in which patients who reported that they rarely or never do any physical activities were considered inactive. The analysis included 225 patients who were not considered as having depression at baseline, although a history 
of depression was permitted and was present in 26.1% of the cohort. Participants, mean age was 45, and almost 90% were women. The sample was diverse with 35% Asian, 35%, I'm sorry, 30% white, 22% Hispanic, and 10% African American, and the remainder classified as unspecified or other. Disease duration was almost 17 years, and the mean lupus severity index was 69 Now, a total of 18% of participants reported being sedentary, and these patients more often were Hispanic or African American, which I have to disagree when it comes to, um, you're evaluating this on 10% of African Americans. Now, since it's based on that 10%, you cannot base that on the entire population of African Americans, in my opinion, that um, suffer from this chronic illness called lupus. Okay, as as stated, um, again, A total of 18% of participants reported being sedentary, and these patients more often were Hispanic or African American. So you mean to tell me out of that, no Asians or whites were sedentary? It's hard to believe. Also, poverty level incomes and were less educated. So you mean to tell me once again that you didn't find that in some Asians and some whites. You only found that in Hispanic and African Americans. Now, over a mean of 26 months of follow-up, there were 37 new cases of depression. In a bivariate analysis, factors that were significantly associated with incident depression were inactivity, 2.89, poverty level income, 2.27, disease damage, 1.23, Cardiovascular disease, 3.46. Stay with me when we return. We'll talk more about this. If you would like to appear on an episode of My Story Living with Lupus, you can contact us at mystorylivingwithlupus at gmail.com. Also visit us on our Instagram page and also our website, My Story Living with Lupus. And we are back. You know, physical exercise helps to improve your mood. You know why? It increases the production of serotonin. Now, serotonin is a critical neurotransmitter found in the brain that is associated with good health and mental health well-being. By increasing serotonin levels in the brain, exercise works as a natural antidepressant. 
That's right. Now, getting back to what researchers are saying about um, individuals with lupus, um, mental health, physical activity, it matters. Now, this study was the first study to confirm an elevated risk for depression among sedentary lupus patients. Given the high burden of depression experienced by lupus patients relative to the general population, even among those with low disease activity and less severe disease. This finding is an important step toward understanding the contribution of lifestyle factors to mood symptoms in a uniquely vulnerable patient group. They recommended that clinicians implement routine screening for physical inactivity during follow-up visits and provide education and referrals for exercise for sedentary patients. Even light activities were beneficial. According to the authors, um, with benefits being seen for patients who did not necessarily meet recommended guidelines for physical activity. The U.S. Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion 2018 Physical Activity Guidelines Update emphasized that even small increases in activity can provide health benefits. Individuals performing the least physical activity benefit most by even modest increases in moderate to vigorous physical activity. In addition to reducing the risk of important physical comorbidities, such as cardiovascular disease. Their data suggests that a small increase in physical activity may also reduce the risk of major mental health challenges experienced disproportionately in SLE. A limitation of the study, they stated, was the reliance on patient reports of disease activity and other related factors. Now, we know it's hard for us to get out and exercise in the winter. Because when, well, I I can only speak for myself. I don't know about anyone else, but... You know, usually I can tell when it's going to rain before it rains. I know when it's going to turn real cold because my body um, is like a trigger. You know, the weather triggers um, my body um, to feel not intense pain, but I feel pain. But there are things that can be done around the home that can get you to move. And if you have teenage kids, turn the radio on and tell them to teach you the latest dances that are that are out here now. Um, another thing you can do, get you a hula hoop. Everyone knows what a hula hoop is. Get you a hula hoop and start um, working on your waist. Get your body to move him with the hula hoop. Go on and put it around your waist and just twirl, baby, twirl. That's right. Get you a hula hoop. Get you a jump rope. 
stop watching so much TV because um, it is my belief, and I'm only speaking for myself, that everything that's going on in the world now, and you're constantly watching the news and watching the TV, that can put anybody into a depression, which in turn may trigger a flare. So get up, get your body moving. Come on. Now, when we return, we are going to be discussing trends and long-term lupus outcomes. So stay with me. All right, we're back and we're getting ready to talk about trends in long-term lupus outcomes. This information is retrieved from Rheumatology Network. Now, the reviewers find persistent disease activity and flares despite progress to date. In addition, they point to the persistence of steroid treatment dependency and comorbidity burden, reduced health-related quality of life, and inconsistent access to high quality of care. Now, long-term outcomes in systemic lupus erythematosus, better known as SLE, have improved over time. But unmet needs include glucocorticoid dependency and comorbidity burden. According to a review, which implicates a number of factors, including demographic and socioeconomic, for the heterogeneity of the clinical presentation. The review was conducted by Laurent Arnaud, MD, PhD, Department of Rheumatology. Now, this doctor you can find on Twitter. I follow him on Twitter. And he's always putting out informative information regarding lupus. Now, earlier diagnosis and treatment advances have resulted in improved outcomes over the past decades. However, increased morbidity and mortality risks persist in SLE. The reviewers find persistent disease activity and flares despite progress to date. In addition, they point to the persistence of steroid treatment dependency, comorbidity burden, reduced health-related quality of life, and inconsistent access to high-quality care. Better understanding of SLE pathogenesis, optimization of prevention, a treat-to-target approach, and introduction of safe and effective treatments based on better design trials and clinical research tools. Taking the heterogeneity of the disease into account as well is crucial for improving outcomes. Now, I did an episode on treat to target approach um, regarding lupus. So you may want to listen to that also. The reviewers consider how long term outcomes with SLE have changed with developments in treatments and healthcare access. 
The principal outcomes they consider are long-term remission or recurrent flares in stage renal disease, nervous system involvement, and cardiovascular and infections burden. Now, Dr. Arnaud note that non-white patients with SLE have tended to develop more severe clinical phenotypes and more damage accrual than whites. The reviewers find that socioeconomic factors can confound those associations, but that an increased genetic risk burden remains an analysis of population incidents that corrects for these conditions. Increased awareness of the above high-risk population can help to improve long-term outcomes in SLE. Although lupus nephritis will be referred as LN, remains a major cause of morbidity and mortality among patients with SLE. The reviewers note that several recent clinical trials of interventions for LN have failed to meet their primary endpoints. This indicates they suggested that not only is there continued need for evaluation of innovative treatments, but that the trial designs must reevaluate patient selection according to clinical phenotypes and biologic markers. That's so true. Neuropsychiatric s- symptoms and involvement of the peripheral as well as central nervous system remain among the most challenging manifestations of SLE. According to the reviewers, diagnosis has remained elusive. They indicate essentially obtained through presumption and exclusion and often confirmed retrospectively based on response to treatment. This status has not been helped. They point out by recent clinical trials in SLE, excluding patients with severe neuropsychiatric manifestations. Arnaud find that there has been a biofurcation in efforts to reduce long-term organ damage in SLE, with some targeting remission while others are directed at maintaining low disease activity, lupus low disease activity state, which is referred to as LLDAS. Considering clinical trial outcomes, they find that remission is a more beneficial outcome than the LLDAS, although the latter is more likely to be achieved. In addition to basic and clinical sciences, the reviewers point to the need for increased attention to social factors. They noted, for example, that poor adherence to therapeutic regimens continues to be common. The accurate identification of non-adherence is crucial as it may help avoid unnecessary treatment escalation. Now, 
I've talked about this also, and I've had doctors to ask me, why is it that some patients don't want to adhere to their treatment protocol as far as taking their medication on a regular basis? That, in turn, will help in the long run. And you know what I've informed doctors? I say, if you guys would take the time to explain to patients um, drug interactions, um, the adverse side effects, good can outweigh the bad effects of the medication. It all boils down to educating the patient on what they're taking. And it is also the patient's responsibility to ask the physician, what are the potential side effects of the medication? Or before the doctor writes the script out, if you know you're not going to take it, don't accept the script. Because when you go back in turn to see the doctor for a follow-up, and we always get our blood drawn, and you can tell through the blood um, what is in your system. But it is up to the patient and the doctor to work hand in hand, the doctor educating the patient and the patient asking questions. Now, they also identify cigarette smoking as a continuing risk factor for SLE, which negatively influences the disease course and response to treatment. Despite this well-known association, however, SLE patients rarely report receiving cessation counseling. You see what I'm saying? When I say it's up to both the patient and the doctor to work together to get your disease taken this illness taken care of so you can go into remission. And hey, leave the cigarettes alone. You know, don't compound one thing, one problem with something that's already going on. Now, Arnaud and associates conclude that several unmet needs in SLE remain, including a variety of disease-related treatment, comorbidity, and access to care factors. Now, despite a substantial improvement in SLE diagnosis and treatment over the years, long-term outcomes are still not adequately improved, they indicate. And that is so true. It's hard finding a good rheumatologist, a good primary care physician. It's hard to find a good doctor, period. But this is where you, the healthcare consumer slash patient, comes into play. You don't have to sit there and continue to take the treatment of a doctor that is not helping you. It's up to you, the patient, the healthcare consumer. If you don't like the doctor, fire the doctor. Stay with me. When we return, we'll talk a little more. and we're back and hopefully no one else will interrupt me but I want to give you some tips um, about your exercise program now come on we all need to um, 
get to moving and being physically active does help our mental health. You know, it's all connected. It really is. Um, you know, mental health professionals often prescribe exercise as part of a treatment for specific mental illnesses. Exercise can alleviate many of the symptoms of depression, such as um, fatigue, tension, anger, and reduced vigor. Now, for people with panic disorder, PTSD, and other anxiety-related conditions, exercise can be a proactive way to release pent-up tension and reduce feelings of fear and worry. Exercise also decreases sensitivity to the body's reaction to anxiety as well as decreases the intensity and frequency of panic attacks in some cases. Exercise promotes a positive well-being. Exercise decreases stress hormones. Physical activity distracts you from negative thoughts and in emotions. Exercise promotes confidence. Exercise can be a good source of of social support. Better physical health may mean better mental health. Exercise provides a buffer against stress. Now, before you start right off into getting active and physically fit, just remember that if you have been sedentary sedentary for a long period of time, get the approval from your doctor before you do any physical activity. Get the approval from your doctor. Okay? All right. But make sure you get up, stay up, and get to moving and keep all the negativity away. Listen here. Before I go, I want to remind you of this. People don't always need advice. Sometimes all they really need is a hand to hold and an ear to listen. And most importantly, a heart to understand now. I thank you so much for joining me for this episode of my story, Living with Lupus Podcast. I want you to have a safe, peaceful, and oh, so blessed weekend. I'll see you next week. Take care.